So, um, you know what? This th that might be a good uh, segue into my next segment, which is my first book review on the channel. I'm really excited to to do this because you know I've been trying to up my reading game. You know, for a long time I'd read a book here and there. Now I'm I have multiple books open <laughs> and uh, on my bedside table. And I know I'm not saying you're not supposed to admit it, but I have a Kindle. Um, you know, uh, w w you know. Sorry, I'm giving Amazon money, but uh, uh, you know, I, it, it helps. As you can see, this bookshelf is chock full. I have books in storage. I'm I'm just trying to read more, and so I uh, I recently read, finished uh, reading this book called The Jakarta Method, and it's by um, Vincent Bevins. Is his name? So really quick, I set something up here so we could do this. Uh, here it is. So I read this book, The Jakarta Method by Vincent Bevins, Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade and the Mass Murder pro Program that Shaped Our World. Uh, Jay Andrew World says the first rule of Kindle is you don't talk about Kindle. Yes. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, you know, I did just order Ben Burgess's new book, Canceling Comedians, and uh, Mark Fisher's Capitalist Realism. Uh, uh, in uh, I ordered them, uh, what you might call it, uh, from Red Emma's independent bookstore. I got hard copies, so you know I'll hold those books up when I when I actually own the hard copy. I'll hold it up for y'all to see. But the Jakarta Method, um, this really is an astounding book. Vincent Bevins uh, was a foreign correspondent for the Washington Post and the L.A. Times, and so not only. Much like what we just saw with that testimony about Tulsa, um, he there's a lot of history in this book, but much of it is told from direct sources, people he met and spoke with who survived some of the most bloodthirsty right-wing uh, governments in modern history, especially in, you know, like a Cold War context, okay? Um Really, I, I can't begin to explain like how astounding some of the things I learned in this book were. These these things include just the realities of you know you you learn a, a lot of really in, like important interesting stuff in this. Like, why do we call the third world countries the third world? What does that even mean? And essentially, you know, it's that uh, after World War II. You had the Western capitalist countries, uh, you know, the United States, of course, Britain, um, you know, Western Europe. And you had, of course, the Soviet uh, communist Russia, the Eastern Bloc, but also uh, communist China. That's the second world. This is the developed world. And then the rest, the global south, the, uh, you know, Africa, um, you know, the, the greater, uh, um, you know, island nations uh, between uh, Australia would definitely was first world, but the greater island nations, you know, uh, um, South Asian, East Asian nations, they uh, were third world. These were the, the countries that had been exploited uh, by, you know, by colonialism and imperialism. And so in the wake of World War II and decolonization, these countries f had finally were forming their own governments and had a degree of autonomy. And of course, you know, there's the whole uh, matter of, you know, the Western world drawing wacky maps all around, um, all around the, the world, you know, uh, whether it's the Middle East or um, areas like, uh, like where Indonesia is, right? Um, I, sh uh, I should have done this earlier, but let me, uh, let me bring up a, uh, a map of Indonesia. Uh, just so you, you get an idea of, you know, the way this country was drawn uh, is really kind of, it shows you kind of how the, uh, how the colonial empires uh, were viewed, viewed uh, uh, this stuff. So really quick, let me just bring it over here. So Indonesia is South Asian country, right? But as you can see, it's multiple islands including some that are like chopped up 
You know what I mean? So you have, uh, what is, is this? Is this, um, let's see. Yeah. So you Kalimantan, um, you know, some, you have like islands like Bali, Sumatra, like you, you could see here, uh, um, you know, Papua New Guinea and, and Indonesia make up half of, uh, um, you know, I, I, I need to know my geography better. Obviously, I don't know the name of this uh, island. Pop, pop out, right? Um, so Indonesia is drawn in this crazy way. And at this time, um, what like another thing that I learned from the Jakarta method that is very interesting, I know I'm going to learn more about this in history class, is how um, very much for post-colonial people, right? Indonesia was a Dutch colony the people who lived there very much recognized and understood who had exploited them. And it was the capitalist world, the uh, Western Europe, the United States. They were the countries that had exploited them and their neighbors. And so communism, but also just socialism, democratic socialism, were viewed very much as, um, you know, as liberatory systems of government uh, for them as exploited colonized people and in in indonesia and the the capital is jakarta um in indonesia they had this president uh, named sukarno and he was very much like a left-wing uh socialist nationalist where he he kind of instituted a national language across all these um, islands where there were multiple languages being spoken um and you know created this ident this this cultural national identity of solidarity among all these people uh the you know these disparate islands and, and groups of people um now at this time and this book details this very well i i have um ec excerpts um at this time the uh the cia was just um, getting to work, was just really kind of developing uh, their skills after World War II. It, it, the book also details how the CIA was like a comedy of errors when it when it first began. It was riddled with, uh, um, you know, before it was even called the CIA, it was riddled with Soviet spies. Um, you had this, uh, th this main uh, CIA, uh, 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 the leader of the CIA, Frank Weisner, I believe is his name. Um, and... He, uh, you know, was de developing these me these methods, and they they weren't like a lot of the interventions that the CIA did CIA did early on, especially in the fifties, were kind of characterized by their incompetence. Here's an excerpt that kind of details that. Um, th this is one of their first great successes before Indonesia was actually Brazil, where they were able to empower the Brazilian right wing. And the Brazilian right wing, um, you know, o overthrew a democratically elected leftist, or I believe he was a vice president who came into power after a right, more conservative president uh, died. Um, and so, let's see, uh, the communist bad guys and their sympathizers were deposed, the good guys were in power, and best of all, this was achieved without the United States needing to appear as a visible agent of conspiracy. So check, the, check out, I... I you know, made a highlight of this part. This was huge and novel. In Iran, 1953. In Guatemala, 1954. Indonesia, 1958. In Cuba, 1961. Anyone who's paying attention knew that Washington had been behind the regime, regime change operations. These very obvious signs of U.S. intervention had not only tainted Washington's image worldwide, they had undermined the efficacy of the states they installed when they were victorious. Guatemala's government fell apart quickly after the CIA-backed coup, as did the Shah's government uh, in Iran, eventually. The achievement in Brazil in 1964 was not only possible because of the new tactics JFK put in place to build alliances with the military. The United States also got lucky. Um, and importantly, Brazil had its own anti uh, very deep anti-communist tradition. Um, and so... Um, the, they reference Indonesia there in uh, 1958. The CIA bombed Indonesia, and literally a CIA pilot was caught. Um, and so it's it's really incredible. Uh, so what happened in Indonesia in 1964 
was they because they were aware the president and left wing uh, people there were aware of the kind of um, the the moves that were being made uh, 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 to, you know by by the Americans by the CIA they were they were more than aware of that um, they uh, you know were were getting paranoid and they were seeing what was going on in Korea in uh, uh, Vietnam and the escalations that the United States were taking and. So there was a believed right-wing coup attempt that the, the left captured several like generals, right-wing military generals, um, and they, they murdered them. They were murdered. And this, was, th this event was used, um, basically instigated the military into action, and they... Uh, they Took control of the country. They shut down newspapers. They took control of, um, you know, certain sectors of industry and the government. Basically, Sukarno, the president, just kind of hid out in his um, in his presidential palace, um, and the leader of the military took took power. I, it should be noted. I, I should mention that you know Vincent Bevins interviewed multiple of these people, and one is this um, this Indonesian man who. He, you know, was super fascinated by international affairs. He was multilingual. Um, you know, he's left wing. And he studied in the United States uh, as an exchange student in college in, at like the University of Kansas, I believe. It could get, be, be wrong. But then he knew, he found out that there were other Indonesians from the military, the Indonesian military, who were studying uh, at a military base down south, Fort Hood maybe. Um, uh, not all these details. I'm not remembering all these details perfectly. I apologize if that's the case. And they would meet up. He would meet up with these military Indonesians. They would make Indonesian food. You know, uh, um, they'd go to strip clubs and get drunk. Woo, America type of thing. And this man ended up working for the UN years later. And he was he was out of the country when the military dictatorship took over. And he, that's when he and he couldn't go back. And it's when he realized, like, that's what that's what those guys were being taught while they were in America. The CIA was training them in anti-communist tactics. Um, so basically, the Jakarta method refers to how the U.S. Uh, or sorry, the, how the the military juntas the dictatorship the militias and and the military murdered hundreds of thousands of people communists socialists leftists intellectuals um you, you know uh, uh, indigenous people people uh, labor union organizers activists artists just oh you're kind of your hair is too long you're a hippie right everybody was called a communist it was a massive purge. Not only that, but our government supplied lists, right? Here's another thing I highlighted. As far as we know, this was at least the third time in history that U.S. officials had supplied lists of communists and alleged communists to allies so that they could round them up and kill them. The first was in Guatemala in 1954. The second was in Iraq in 1963. And now on a much larger scale was Indonesia in 1965. Quote, it was a really big help to the army, said Martins, who was a member of the U.S. Embassy's political section. I probably have a lot of blood uh, on my hands, but that's not all bad. This is a CIA, this is a CIA guy saying this. Um, another incredible, um, so I, I have a few other notes. Throughout the course of the CIA's history, this dynamic would often be repeated. The agency would act behind the back of diplomats and experts at the State Department. If the CIA was successful, the State Department would be forced into backing the new state of affairs the agency had created. If the secret agents failed, they would just move on, leaving the embarrassed diplomats to clean up the mess. That's referring to the bombing. Um, um, uh, you know, in 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 the fifties. Um, but hold on, I got to get to the part. Okay, so. Literally, so in the island of Bali, the right wing, they killed like tw like 10 to 20 percent of the entire population of the island. Um, it, this this passage just stuck out to me in such an incredible way. This um, this one 
man was disappeared. This is when the the military or the police would just come and they would take you in the middle of the night and they say, oh, we have to question you or whatever, this and that, and then you were never seen again. In Bali, people became aware that, oh, they're taking everyone and they're killing them at this beach area. This beach area is now like a tourist destination with fancy hotels. This is what capitalism did to this country, uh, uh, to Indonesia. This is um, in U.S. foreign policy. You know, Instagram yoga influencers are doing poses uh, on this beach. That was a killing field. Listen to this passage. For Balinese Hindus, the loss of a family member's body is a deep spiritual spiritual tragedy of infinite consequence. So a few years after the violence ended, a gung went with his family to find his father's body and give him an honorable funeral and cremation. They walked four kilometers to the site where someone told them they could find his remains. They found a field of bodies. They began looking through, through bones, picking up skulls. Someone shouted, this is Mr. Raka, but no. That skull didn't look right. Maybe the hair was wrong. Maybe that one? They kept sorting through decomposing bodies desperately for minutes before someone realized it was impossible. Crazy. There were just, quote, too many skulls, too many skeletons. They walked back home for an hour, processing the knowledge they would never lay him to rest and sickened by the vast sea of humanity they had just entered. In total, at least, sorry, I, I, I got the, the number wrong. In total, at least 5% of the population of Bali was killed. That is 80,000 people, probably the highest proportion in the country. Um, so in Indonesia, literally, like, they, the military and the police were scooping up people in the night. People would disappear, right? And, you know, people would just be like, what are they doing? Where are they taking them? And literally... The like rivers would stop flowing or they would go down to a trickle and the water would be putrid and um, and and smell disgusting. And people would go follow up the river and they would find it dammed up with human bodies. The, it's believed some of the estimates have the, the killings up to one million people, one million people killed Um in Jakarta alone. Now, th this they call it. Why is it called the Jakarta method? Because this th these tactics were exported to South America. They were used in Chile by Pinochet. Um, you know, they're definitely used uh, in Brazil, but in uh, specifically um, in Chile before Pinochet took power, um, people were tagging in you know like areas of the capital jakarta is coming jakarta is coming um so you know here's another here's another passage uh for hardened anti-communists around the world the method behind this quote savage transformation would soon be an, as an inspiration a playbook but how could the international press and the State Department re remain entirely untroubled by the fact that this was achieved through the mass murder of unarmed civilians? Howard Federspiel at the State Department summed up the answer perfectly. No one cared, he recalled, as long as they were communists, that they were being butchered. No one cared. Um, let's see. I, I want to... Um, and this had massive ramifications on just the, the reality of politics in across the world as VJ, uh, here's a quote from Vijay Prashad director of the uh, Tricontinental Institute put put it the destruction of the left had an enormous impact on the third world the most conservative even reactionary social class has attained dominance over the political platform created in Bandung this is in Thailand as an adjunct to the military regimes the political forces that emerge rejected the ecumenical anti-colonial nationalism of the left and the liberals for a cruel cultural nationalism that emphasized racialism religion in hierarchy um, let's see and and this is really interesting um, internationally when anti-communism is the ruling ideology oh and, and guys keep in mind there's a thing in South America called Operation Condor where basically Chile and uh, Brazil worked in tandem to disappear leftists across South America 
So it, internally, when anti-communism is the ruling ideology, almost the national religion, any legitimate complaint from below can easily be dismissed as communism. Anything that would be an obvious inconvenience to the small clique of rich families that run the country can be easily categorized as dangerous revolution and cast aside. This includes any whiff of socialism or social democracy, any land reform, and any regulation that would reduce monopoly power and allow for more efficient development and market competition it includes unions and any normal demands for workers rights um you know and you might ask why were these things allowed in say like scandinavian countries like norway sweden um and th this was uh, according to this woman from indonesia it was very clear to french uh, Francisco, why Europeans were allowed to experiment with social democracy and even communist politics while her country had been taken away from her forever. Racism this is a quote. Very simply, white, European, white Europeans are offered tolerance and sympathetic treatment while we are not. Um, and so, yes, this book, I mean, this book is a downer, but <laughs> it, we have to know about this stuff. If, if if we want the left to grow in in the United States and across the world in an international um, you know way, and as we're seeing promising signs in South America with Evo Morales, uh, Lula da Silva, Lula Livre is now going to run for president uh, against uh, fascist Jair Bolsonaro. We have to we have to recognize not what could happen, but what has happened, right? As we were talking about before with Tulsa, the history is not behind us. It's with us. It absolutely informs right here and now. And the left has to wise the fuck up and realize that this has been done to us internationally. Like mass graves, mass killing, millions of people murdered in cold blood by, by the right, um, by right wing nationalists ethno nationalists religious nationalists um they've done it before don't think they won't do it again we have to be smart we have to be um just ahead of the game on all of this stuff that's how i see this that that's why i um you know that that's why i i i think we need to be i mean not only do we need to know our history but we need to be smart going forward um, I mean, th here's another excerpt really quick. The fourth way that anti-communist extermination programs shape the world is that they deform the world socialist movement. Many of the global left-wing groups that did survive the 20th century decided that they had to employ violence and jealousy, uh, jealously guard power or face annihilation. When they saw the mass murders taking place in these countries, it changed them. Um, uh, maybe U.S. citizens weren't paying close attention to what happened in Guatemala or Indonesia, but other leftists around the world definitely were watching. When the world's largest communist party without an army or dictatorial control of a country was massacred one by one with no consequences for the murderers, many people around the world drew lessons from this with serious consequences. So when you hear someone talk, you know, especially right-wingers uh, talk about how, vi you know, oh, they, like they want to characterize socialism as just the Soviet Union or just China, authoritarian, um, you know, uh, uh, top-down, anti-democratic, uh, you know, state-run, state, you know, uh, uh, state economies. Well, you, I mean, why, why was that the case? Why were they so authoritarian? Why, why uh, were they so, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, culling of dissent in those countries? Well, because literally every other socialist project across the world, every other leftist movement faced massacre, faced murder, like thuggish, um, being taken away in the night from your children, uh, you know, women raped. Uh, you know, uh, in Argentina and other South American countries, there are literally, you know, groups that are reuniting children with, the, with families because it was a practice of the right to abduct pregnant women and uh uh you know we don't i mean we don't really know uh how the babies were delivered if they were in fact delivered or if they were ripped from the from these poor women um as they were killed or what but these children were taken from the mothers the mothers were never seen again they were murdered and did they were disappeared the desparacito and uh they were these children were given to, 
you know, people who cooperated with uh, the dictatorships. So, you know, the, the, it's that evil. It's that level of evil is done was done to people who, um, you know, were just left wing. Um, let's see. Yeah, and, and th this just blew my mind. Um, looking at it this way, the major losers of the 20th century were those who believed too sincerely in the existence of a liberal international order. Those who trusted too much in democracy or too much in what the United States said it supported, rather than what it really supported, what the rich countries said, rather than what they did. That group was annihilated. So th th that's from part of the book where some of these folks are reminiscing, um, you know, these survivors of this shit are reminiscing on like what went wrong. Not all of the book, uh, you know, the book doesn't end on a total down note. There's actually, um, the last chapter is, is a bit inspiring um, because it, it kind of shares little vignettes of many of these people, these survivors, and where they are now, what they're doing. You know, one, one man, the man I mentioned who, uh, in the UN, who uh, who worked for the UN, he's retired, uh, um, you know, he's in his, in his 90s here in the United States. He, you know, just got his citizenship, um, you know, ha had to come to the country that ravaged his, his home country, uh, you know, at the end of his life for safety, I assume. But uh, there's also a lot of Indonesian expatriates are in, um, went to, uh, 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 you know, Amsterdam and, you know, were, like they were a Dutch colony and now that's where they live. And it's just incredible. Like that's the only place they could find peace as a leftist and feel truly safe was in their their the the countries that former formerly co uh, colonized them or or you know were responsible for all this uh, mayhem, or at least partly responsible for for uh, the you know being an antecedent to it. And uh, one one part I really enjoyed was uh, th this woman who's in her nineties. Uh, who you know still reads every new left socialist book, and even in the footnote mentions that she really loves this capitalist realism by Mark Fisher, which is a book I've just bought and I will review once I'm uh, done with it here. But um, I can't recommend the Jakarta Method enough, guys. Vincent Bevins has done incredible work, um, you know. So uh, pick it up, read it, because um, you you got to know this stuff, um, and and. You got to understand what is possible, what was done. Um, devoid reality in the comments. Don't forget recently El Salvador and Honduras. Absolutely. What's going on in Colombia right now? The violence of Bolsonaro uh, uh, and, and Brazilian police. Um, what's his name? Uh, oh, the interview. I, I played the uh, clip of the interview um, on This Is Revolution. The guy from Brazil Wire saying, you know, that, uh, that fascism never, never really left Brazil. Um, let's see, uh, J. Andrew World adds, this is what we are doing to the Griffin of people in Honduras today. We are disappearing their leaders to build American hotels. Absolutely disgusting. It is, it's still happening now. Um, uh, Trev Flat Five is getting all, uh, um, he's getting all, uh, uh, revolutionary in there. Uh. You know, evil Yoda with a raised fist and a black flag and a red flag, <laughs> anarchists and in, in the and communists together, I believe. Um, you know, uh, Trev Flat Five anti-communist equals anti-human. Um, J. Andrew World in 2014, Mexico surpassed the U.S. deportations, and both Trump and Biden are trying to get the Northern Triangle to expand concentration uh, camps to prevent immigrants reaching the U.S. Yeah, um, Evil Yoda, got to make the business class submit to the workers and people before this shit happens again. Um, yeah, so I, I really recommend everybody read The Jakarta Method by Vincent Bevins. And it's just, it's such a masterfully crafted book. I mean, call, call me biased, a journalist who is uh, going to go get a history degree. Um, but, you know, this is an international reporter who, you know, really connected... A lot of what might be seen as disparate things, uh, uh, you know, by, by some, but it's not. It's all connected. Um, but but connecting history to this lived moment, because these people are alive, the people who survived this massacre. If that woman we just watched uh, testify in Congress earlier, 107, and has a living memory of the Tulsa race massacre in Oklahoma, you know, these people, which was uh, 1921. 
these people who survived a massacre of hundreds of thousands of people in their home country of Indonesia um, <clears throat> in you know in the 60s and then the following uh, mayhem in South America in uh, uh, the 70s and, and and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s right um, you know the, it, this is with us right now and we need we have to be aware we, we have to be aware of it. Um, and we have to bring it into our analysis of world events. Um, when we look at uh, Israel and Palestine, you know, uh, and, and you realize that instead of calling, you know, everyone bad, a, a, a communist or everybody who they, they want to justify obliterating a communist, they're calling them a terrorist or a human shield of terrorists, right? So the, this, this, dehumanizing language it's it's and and state violence state violence is the state terrorism is the right wing's most potent powerful tool okay and it's been employed across the world and why the it's called the jakarta method is because the success that the united states had was that the CIA's fingerprints weren't obviously all over this because they were able to empower a right-wing, ethno-religious, nationalist, uh, you know, strong faction within that country to take the matter into their hands and massacre, um, you know, a million people. And they, um, there, there's actually a documentary you can watch called The Act of Killing, um, I've watched a good amount of it. Jay and your world, thank you for bringing it up a couple streams ago. I was watching it, and and the the these killers are still alive. They still enjoy uh, comfortable lives, political power in uh, in Indonesia. And that documentary asks them to like reenact and re relive that moment, and it's really sickening. Um, and I appreciate this book because it tells. This story from the from the the view of the the leftists, who were just excited to have this this new country that they wanted to help shape, and there there was a really a coalition of leftists and left solidarity. There were communists, there were socialists, democratic socialists, there were labor activists, union uh, uh, people, there were internationalists. Right, one one was a woman who. Um, she would provide translation. She was she was a multilingual polyglot, and she would do translation for conferences and other events. She should go all over the world. Um, and her husband was like an editor and a, and a reporter for the local communist paper. And her husband was was murdered and disappeared. And she ended up fleeing the country with her children. So highly recommend that book, The Jakarta Method by Vincent Bevins. Check it out, guys. Pick it up. Um, um, let's see. It's called The Act of Killing, Jay and Your World. Uh, and I thought you did bring it up. Uh, and Trev Flat 5 says, Watch Banana Land. Yeah. Um, Evil Yoda knowledge should not be for sale. Yeah. Well, luckily, we have this thing called the library, Yoda. Um, I know you're in Canada, but <laughs> on, a, on a reservation yourself. Um, but, uh, you know, l literally, you can find a municipal library. Guess what? A lot of libraries, you can do an ebook rental. You can get a, an app on your phone that doesn't cost anything and um, do an ebook rental through your uh, local library, hopefully. So, yeah, there's ways of getting this stuff for free, you know. Um, but, anywho. Whoo, that, oh, it's heavy stuff, guys. That is, that is heavy stuff. But I appreciate you uh, being here with me for that because um, that's very important. 